Today we're going to be talking about generational curses. And the reason why we're going to be talking about that is because God absolutely wants the people that he created to be free. And he wants us to be free specifically from the power of the devil, the power of sin. When we talk about the devil, we are literally talking about a being, a spiritual being that is not, that does not exist physically in the physical dimension, but he exists in a higher, a spiritual dimension, but he dictates things by manipulating people in this dimension, just like he manipulated man in the Garden of Eden in the book of Genesis chapter 3. But, but we're talking about generational curses because we're talking about the, some of the things that are holding people back from prospering as sons of God. And when we use the term prosper, we are specifically talking about living the lifestyle of Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about the ancient Hebrew way. We're talking about what Jesus did, what Jesus said. We're talking about him being the express image of his father, but also the standard of what every man is designed of God to be in some form or another. The Word of God talks about how Jesus Christ has the very fullness of the Father's Spirit, but you and I get a measure of that. We get a portion of that, and so God wants us to maximize that portion. But one of the things that hinder that are generational curses. Now, a generational curse can be defined as a spiritual consequence that works against the descendants of the wicked. So a generational curse is a spiritual repercussion, a spiritual consequence that works against the descendants, the children of ungodly people. It can also be described as the, the negative effects of the evil of past generations and, and uh, against subsequent generations. So the negative effects of the evil of past generations on latter generations, on subsequent generations. So look at, let's look at some, some scriptural examples of this. Cain, obviously, was the child of Adam. Adam and his wife, they decided to rebel against God and eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And because of that, their, their offspring had the fallen nature and reaped a consequence. And this is what we look at as a generational curse. So because Cain was the child of a, of a person who had, who had fallen from the grace of God, fallen from the, the, the focus on God, Cain wasn't focused on God except for in religious ritual. Many people are focused on God religiously, but not from their hearts. And so Cain was among them. But Outside of his religious behavior, he walked sinfully. He would not have even had the compulsion to sin had his father not rebelled against God by eating the fruit. So Genesis 4 came killing Abel. It, that was the result of Adam disobeying God in the garden. So that's the type of generational curse right there. So sin is a kind of generational curse and murder in that sense was the manifestation of Adam's deeds, Adam's behavior. Uh, uh, when Noah's son Canaan, or when Noah's son Ham, disrespected his father, Noah didn't curse his son Ham, he cursed his, Noah cursed his own grandson Canaan and told him he would be a servant of servants. That's a generational curse. In Exodus chapter 20, Right in the midst of the Ten Commandments, God reveals a, a, a specific way that he deals with the wicked. He tells them in verses 4 through 6 that he is a jealous God and he will visit the iniquity or punish the people unto third and fourth generations of those who hate him. So he's saying that when you are a hater of God, then he will punish you unto your third and fourth Generation, And so when we talk about generational curses, we're not talking about people being guilty of their father's sins like Ezekiel 18 talks about. Ezekiel 18 talks about people not being guilty of their parents' sins. But what they are is affected 
by their parents or affected by their parents' sins. And so that's what a generational curse is. It is a negative effect on descending generations of people. And God promised to curse those who, uh, who, who, who hate him and to repay them to their faces. In Daniel chapter 9, Daniel is praying, asking God to forgive the sins of his ancestors, knowing that the reason why he was living in captivity in Babylon was because of the sins of the ancestors. It wasn't Daniel's sins. It wasn't Josiah's sins that brought calamity or brought destruction on Israel. It was the sins of his grandfather, Manasseh. It was the sins of Daniel's ancestors that had rebelled against God, that had brought problems. And, 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 and this is this concept, this reality is seen throughout the entire scriptures. We see generational curses that keep people in bondage because of the sins of parents, which is why you have to be mindful because a generational curse is like a cloud. It's like a storm over a person's life that prevents them from succeeding as sons of God as they ought if there weren't a generational curse. Uh, Israel, Jesus talked to uh, the children of Israel and he told them that they would experience days of revenge, days of God's vengeance, not just because of the sins that they were committing currently, but because of the sins of generations past. There was a snowball effect and it was affecting generations. And then in Revelation chapter 2, verse 20 through 23, God talks about killing the children of a false prophetess with death. It didn't say her children were ungodly. It said that she was ungodly and she would bring death on her household. And so this, and, and it seemed, when David sin, uh, sinned with Bathsheba, it reaped death on her household. So fornication, adultery, Pornography, these are things that cause generational curses on families, oppression on descending generations. Generational curses work in the form of sickness, disease, physical disability, as in this guy, uh, an example of that is a man named Gehazi. Gehazi was a servant of, uh, of a prophet whose name was Elisha. Elisha was a man of God and Gehazi was uh, one who helped Elisha in the service of God, but Gehazi got greedy and decided to go after money, and he got cursed. Elisha cursed Gehazi with a skin-eating disease, leprosy, and it affected not just Gehazi, it affected his children. And so that's how a generational curse can work. It works in the form of sickness, and it works in the form of disease or mental retardation, handicap, all of these things are manifestations of generational curses. It doesn't mean that you're just because you have a sickness or just because you have a disease, it's necessarily pointing to what your parents did necessarily. But we know that the only reason why sickness exists in the world is because death came onto all men through the sins of Adam and his wife. And so we realize that every form of, of curse is a generational curse in essence and that's why Jesus Christ came. We'll get into that in a moment but sickness, disease, physical disability, all of these things can be dealt with if we understand the root of them. Poverty, poverty in itself just means you lack what you need to prosper according to the call of God on your life. Well, in, uh, Eli, Eli who was a high priest before Samuel, the prophet Samuel, reigned as, the, as a, a ruler, as a leader. In Israel, Eli was rebellious and would not, uh, not necessarily that he was rebellious in himself, but he, he was rebellious in that he did not correct his sons appropriately, and that brought a generational curse of poverty on his descendants. Not only did his sons die for their sins, but all that would be born from Eli's Eli's lineage would be poor according to 1 Samuel 2 verse 36. So poverty, and, 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 I, and I, it's a reality that in most situations, when you're talking about social poverty, you're talking about the manifestation of sins, the consequence of the sins of former generations, even if that sin is laziness. Laziness will bring a generational curse. Fatherlessness. 
Five, illegitimacy is a form of a generational curse. In Psalm 109 verses 4 through 20, I mean, it, you got to read Psalm 109 verse 4 through 20. It talks about David. David is speaking a prayer against those who hate him, those who hate God, and he's, he's speaking illegitimacy over, over these people. He's saying, let their children be without a father. You know what, uh, what society without fathers do? They act like thugs and rebels. Most of the people that you see behaving like rebels and thugs have poor relationships with their fathers or their fathers are absent. And so when, when, we, when you see generational fatherlessness, we're talking about generational curses active in a society. Chemical addiction. Chemical addiction is, uh, can be a manifestation of a, gener of a generational curse. A, a, a parent can be chemically addicted to alcohol or some other kind of drug and that negatively affect their children. That can negatively affect their children. Their children can be in poverty, their children can be uh, exposed to it. Sometimes generational curses manifest because a child sees their parent doing evil and so they do evil. That is a, that's a manifestation of a curse that passes from one generation to the next. Demonic oppression. A child can be haunted by demon spirits in their room. A child can be uh, haunted by all manner of evil. A child can be can have devils inside of its body. Generations can pass like that if the parents are watching vile things on television or, or, or interacting with ungodly friends or listening to profane music. All that stuff will pass on to the child if the parent expose the child to that and the only thing that will protect the child in that situation is the grace and the mercy of God. But generally speaking, what we're seeing is we're seeing youth afflicted demonically because of what their parents are doing. And Psalm 78 verse 49 talks about that. Bad attitudes or rebellious conduct many times are a manifestation of rebellious cultures past. You talk about the baby boomers and what they were into, the folks in the 60s and how they were involved in all kinds of ungodliness. And that stuff just passes on from one generation to the next. And these are things that the Bible prophesied. The Word of God, Paul, prophesied in 2 Timothy chapter 3, talks about sinners. And he talked about they would be rebellious against parents. They'd be all kind of ways. Why? Because there is a, there is a descending Influence. There's a descending influence of the devil on subsequent generations. Demons work to enforce generational curses. Psalm 70 verse 49 says, He cast upon them the fierceness of his anger, wrath, and indignation, and trouble by sending evil angels among them. So one of the ways that God punishes the disobedient is by sending evil angels among them. These evil angels don't just affect the sinners, they affect those that, those that are in relationship with the sinners. So a, a person whose mother is walking in rebellion, who invites devils into the home through her rebellion, that devil's not just going to affect her, it's going to affect her descending generations, it's going to affect her children. If she's in witchcraft, it's going to affect her seed by affecting her. And so even though she's the guilty party, this child is going to be affected by association. That's why we have to be real mindful. I mean, there's so many scriptures in the Word of God that point to this as a as an epidemic that the body of Christ needs to rise up and deal with. Death is the ultimate generational curse. We understand that Romans 5.17 says, For if by one man's offense or crime or sin, death reigned by one. So death reigns in life because of Adam's defiance. So my defiance produces death on all that I influence or that I'm attached to. That's why we cannot defy the Almighty God. It's not just affecting us, it's affecting our children. For if by one man's offense, death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit can enable believers 
to identify and break generational curses. The verse that we just read in, in Romans 5.17 lets us know that though Adam brought death, Jesus brings life. Adam brought death on his descendants, and you and I are descendants of Adam. But Jesus Christ brings life to all who would believe in him. And he releases the power of the Holy Spirit who enables us to know if a generational curse, and not just if, but where, generational curses are operating in our lives. And he enables us to be free. Why? Because he is the living, life-giving influence, spirit, inspirer. He is the comforter. The Holy Ghost comes in, and in, in John chapter 16, it says that when he comes, he's going to deal with the people who receive him on three levels. He's going to reprove or correct the world, and it's describing the masses that would receive him, of sin, righteousness, and of judgment. The Holy Ghost is going to identify if you're walking in sin, or if there's an influence in your life that is demonic, the Holy Ghost comes to deal with the fact that you've rebelled. He's come to deal with the how you ought to live. So he comes to lead you in making right decisions. But he's also come to bring judgment on the devil. He comes to punish the, the devil and his works for having influenced and inspired man to do evil, bringing iniquity on our children. The Spirit of God wants to bring us freedom so we can serve, the, the, the Spirit of God wants to bring us freedom so we can serve God with an open heart, with a willing heart, without the influence of the, the oppression our parents through their disobedience may have exposed us to. A lifestyle of faith in God can produce generational blessings instead or in the place of curses. When you and I live a life of faithfulness to God, Philip the Evangelist had four daughters who were prophets. Four daughters. I'm talking about New Testament for those who don't believe in the prophetic anointing. The Bible lets us know that Philip the Evangelist, because of his commitment to God, what did God give him? He gave him a heritage of spirit-inspired utterance, in a, a heritage of the prophetic call. God will manifest blessings. He manifests curses to those that hate him unto the third or fourth generation. And that's why the devil keeps getting people to sin, because the devil wants to keep the curse going. See, the devil can only inhabit our realm if we walk in darkness. If we don't walk in darkness, he has no authority in this realm because God gave man dominion in the realm. Because man gave dominion back to the devil and continuously give dominion back to the devil through rebellion, he inhabits the atmosphere and he inhabits the, the, the subterranean world. He's got a whole kingdom that's above us that we can't see and that's underneath us that we can't see and he afflicts man from both of those points. But the only way that he can continue to activate uh, his, his, his affliction is through our disobedience. And so he works in our lives attempting to, 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 to secure and to solidify his position. But the Spirit of God wants to give us freedom from that. A lifestyle of faith can produce generational blessings. In Acts chapter 2 verse 17, Peter is is reiterating a, a prophecy of Joel where it says, and it shall come to pass in the last days when we agree that we're in the last days, says God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Philip was a living example of this. Hopefully your household will be a living example of what happens when you plug into the God of creation through His Son, Jesus Christ. When you submit yourself to God, what we're hoping is that you will manifest, and we know this to be a precedent set in the Word of God, but men of God are experiencing this all over the world, where their children are experiencing a greater anointing than they have. Why? Because they are submitted to God, and God is pleased, just like with Abraham, to bless His seed forever. Solomon came into a kingdom of peace. Why? Because his father's faithfulness. Not because he was faithful. His father was faithful and Solomon inherited peace for 40 years even though he began to fall off in the end. And because he began to fall off, the kingdom was split from Rehoboam, his son. So we saw a generational curse activated in Rehoboam's life that Solomon is the one that caused. And so your defiance will cause the curse, but your submission 
will release the blessing of God. God wants to bless you. The greatest blessing he wants to bless you with is salvation. Salvation can be yours. You must be born again. Uh, in the same book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 37 to 40, it reads this. Now, when they heard this, when they heard the message Peter preached, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brothers, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission, the withdrawal, the removal of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, for the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as the many, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And so what we're talking about, and then look at verse 40. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourself from this untoward or this rebellious generation. And so we're talking about freedom from generational curses, acknowledging that every influence that's demonic, satanic, or sinful in your life can only plague you because of things done in generations past. But that you can take a stand as a child of God. If you are not born again, you must be devoted to God in order to be free from generational curses. Accepting the gospel doesn't automatically make you free. Just like as if you, 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 you went to jail for a crime you did commit and automatically you, you, know, you give your life to Jesus Christ. They're not going to let you go. Jesus is ultimately the one who positioned you in jail for your crime. So we know that God is ultimately the orchestrator of events. If you defy God and God allows you to go to jail, if you, uh, if you atone with God through Jesus, it doesn't mean that Jesus is going to speak to the warden and have them release you, even because you've committed a crime against society. What does that show? That shows us that just because you are free in your spirit, doesn't mean that there aren't still negative effects in your body. Some of you who were addicted to alcohol and you got free by the power of Jesus Christ, it doesn't mean that the Lord automatically healed your liver of the damage that you did, but he can. And so this is what we're talking about. We're talking about not accepting the fact that you are under a curse because of what your past generations did, your parents did, your ethnic group did, but understanding that yes, you are guilty. And even if you are not guilty per se, Yes, your parents were guilty, exposing you to negative influences. You picked up those habits, or you are just being influenced by the spirits that your parents have been walking, uh, have been obeying, and, and, and they've been plaguing your mind, plaguing your, plaguing your emotions. Jesus Christ has come to deliver people who are guilty or who are affected by the guilty. He comes to liberate the captives. He comes to set the captives free, the, the imprisoned free. This is what Jesus Christ comes to do. Now, if you want this, all you have to do is give your heart to God by believing on his son, Jesus. If you believe in your heart that God resurrected Jesus Christ from the dead, and that, well, first of all, that Jesus died for your sins, that your sins can be removed through what Jesus did. If you believe that, if you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your crimes, that he rose again, God raised him the third day, and that, and that he's coming again to judge the world. If you believe that, if you say to him out of your mouth, Lord, I believe these things, I'm going to follow you forever. I'm going to devote my life to you. If you believe that, you can be free from the power of Satan. You can be free from the power of death. You can be free from the influence of the enemy. You can be free, regardless of what your parents did, regardless of what you did. Do you deserve this? No, Jesus deserves it. His mercy endures forever. Mercy is what gives you good things, even though you deserve bad things. Mercy is what prevents you from receiving the curse that you deserve. And so come to Jesus Christ, my brothers and sisters. Uh, the Lord is, uh, is giving you this opportunity. And the Bible says today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart.